Skidmore, Missouri is a town that some consider haunted by memories of terrible crimes. For the residents, though, Skidmore is a quiet little town tucked into the northwest corner of the state, and while bad things may happen, it's no different than any other small town in America. For one family, though, they may not share that feeling. Branson Perry was a driven, smart, and kind young man who had lived in Skidmore for most of his life. After his parents' divorce, he moved in with his father, Bob, who was suffering from several health issues. In April of 2001, Bob was hospitalized, and Branson invited some friends over to help get things squared away at the house, so that when Bob was released, everything would look good. Unfortunately, that same day, Branson would mysteriously vanish. Investigators found themselves six days behind a missing persons case in which almost nothing made sense. Throughout their investigation, they would examine the local drug scene, the behaviors of a convicted felon, and even the activities of those who Branson may have known and trusted. Both of Branson's parents have since passed away, going to their graves without knowing the truth of what became of their son. And to this day, the disappearance of Branson Perry remains one of the most frustrating and difficult unsolved cases in the state of Missouri. What happened to Branson Perry, and why, after nearly 20 years, has nothing conclusive been discovered? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 89, The Vanishing of Branson Perry. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the details surrounding the mysterious disappearance of Branson Perry. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focusing on a different unsolved case each week. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at traceevpod, on Instagram at traceevidencepodcast, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, social media links, merchandise, and more. As a final note, Trace Evidence is a complete one-man operation, so if you'd like to help support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash traceevidence, where you can gain rewards such as stickers, pins, and other surprises. If Patreon isn't your thing, but you still want to pitch in, there is a PayPal donation button on the website. Today, we examine the disappearance of 20-year-old Branson Perry from Skidmore, Missouri in April of 2001. This is Episode 89, The Vanishing of Branson Perry. Branson Kane Perry was born on February 24, 1981 to parents Bob and Rebecca, and they would raise him in the small town of Skidmore, Missouri. Three years later, Branson would have a younger brother named Philip. Skidmore, located in the northwest corner of the state in Nottaway County, is perhaps beyond what we often imagine when we hear the term small town. As of the 2010 census, Skidmore had a population of just 284 residents, and according to public records, the largest the town had ever been was in 1910 when it reached 562 residents. As small as the town is, and getting smaller every year, you may know more about this town than you think. In most cases, the hometown of a victim, especially if it's the same town the victim disappeared from, sets the background, creates the atmosphere, and shows you a peek into their world. In the case of Skidmore, however, this is a town beloved by residents and speculated about by outsiders based on past crimes. Just five months after Branson's birth, Skidmore would become the scene of a public murder for which no one has ever been charged. Ken McElroy was known to everyone in Skidmore and has been commonly referred to as the town bully. Bully, though, may be too light of a description for a man who, through the course of his life, had been accused of child molestation, arson, statutory rape, burglary, cattle theft, and assault. McElroy, though, always found his way around these charges, with many of them never even reaching the courtroom. McElroy was indicted for crimes 21 times and only received a single conviction, mostly due to witnesses suddenly changing their minds about testifying, 
usually after a visit from McElroy. McElroy's luck ran out in 1981 when he was finally convicted for shooting Skidmore local Ernest Bowenkamp, 70 at the time, in the neck the previous year. In 81, McElroy would appeal the conviction and get himself released on bond, and during this time he would ignite a firestorm of terror against the town. McElroy harassed and threatened anyone who he believed to be supporting Bowenkamp who had survived the shooting. On July 9th, McElroy burst into the D&G tavern brandishing a rifle with bayonet attached, during which time he made multiple threats, including that he would kill Bowenkamp. Frightened and unsure of what to do, the residents of Skidmore arranged a town hall meeting with the sheriff to discuss what they could do to protect themselves. During this meeting, McElroy arrived in town and returned to the D&G tavern for a drink. When word reached the townspeople attending the meeting, the sheriff suggested that they avoid direct confrontation with McElroy and instead consider forming a neighborhood watch program. After the meeting, the sheriff reiterated his advice and drove out of town. The people of Skidmore, though, had had enough, and they marched over to the tavern. There, McElroy sat drinking until he finally purchased some alcohol for the road, exited the tavern, and climbed into his truck, along with his wife, Trina. McElroy had met Trina when she was 12, got her pregnant at 14, and the teen later dropped out of school and moved in with McElroy and his former wife, whom he would divorce in order to marry Trina and bypass statutory rape laws as then Trina would be the only person who could verify that the rape had taken place. Trina later tried to escape, along with McElroy's former wife, but he found them at Trina's mother's home and forced them to return with him. He later paid a visit to Trina's mother's home again, at which time he killed the family dog and set the house on fire. So after leaving the tavern and climbing into his truck, McElroy was shot and killed. Apparently, multiple shots were fired, and when all was said and done, McElroy had been hit twice from shots fired by two separate rifles. No one called for an ambulance, despite there being nearly 50 witnesses in the area at the time the murder took place. When police came to investigate, not a single witness reported seeing anything or having any idea who could have pulled the trigger. Trina was the only person to point towards a shooter, but no charges were ever filed. And afterward, Trina filed a $6 million wrongful death suit, for which she would ultimately receive a little less than $20,000. Now, maybe the murder of McElroy is one of those instances where, while you don't agree with murder, you may view this as a town defending itself against a lunatic, and that would be difficult to argue against, but this is only one instance. While the crime rate of Skidmore isn't exactly off the charts, I think it's the small town feel which makes the crimes feel much more heinous. Such as in October of 2000, less than a year before Branson Perry would vanish, when 25-year-old Wendy Gillenwater was brutally murdered by her then-boyfriend, Greg Dragoo. The official autopsy report stated that Wendy had been stomped to death. Dragu would receive a life sentence for this heinous crime, though Wendy's murder would hang over the town like a dark cloud. Between McElroy and Gillenwater, for being such a small town, Skidmore was earning a reputation. Things would only get worse over the next few years. Branson Perry was, by all accounts, a polite, kind, and caring young man. While bright, there does seem to be some implication that perhaps school didn't grab his attention and his focus may have been on different activities. All in all, he was much of what you'd expect of a young man growing up in a small town. Branson was diagnosed with tachycardia, meaning that his resting heart rate was faster than average, with tachycardia being diagnosed in adults whose resting heart rate is above 100 beats per minute. Unfortunately, not a great deal of information is available about Branson's childhood, upbringing, and behaviors, though I have found absolutely nothing to suggest he was anything beyond what you might imagine as a Midwestern kid, growing up in a small town and dreaming of bigger things down the road. Branson would go on to attend Nottaway Holt High School, located in the nearby town of Graham, just nine miles to the southeast of Skidmore. Branson graduated in 1999 and immediately went into working, picking up odd jobs around town. In her book, Baby Be Mine, author Diane Fanning touches on Branson's story in a few places and states that he had, after high school, worked both as a roofer and that he did maintenance for a traveling petting zoo. From most accounts, Branson appeared to have moved from job to job during this time of his life, 
sometimes working full-time and at other periods being unemployed, such as the life for many who graduate high school and are either unsure of their futures or unable to get where they want to go. One thing we do know about Branson's leisure time activities that paints a more vivid portrait is that he was physically fit and took good care of himself. According to his listing on the Charlie Project, Branson was both a weightlifter and a practitioner of Hapkido, a Korean martial art with its focus being primarily on self-defense. Students of Hapkido are trained to deflect an opponent's attack rather than to block, and students are taught joint locks, throws, and kicking techniques for both distance and close encounter fights. Branson was dedicated to the art and earned a black belt, suggesting he knew how to efficiently and powerfully utilize his 5'9", 155-pound frame. It's interesting, especially considering the details which surround his disappearance, as many believe Branson was capable of taking care of himself. Of course, Branson's heart condition had to be taken into consideration as well. Apparently, following his graduation from high school, he'd had intentions of joining the military, but his medical condition would disqualify him during a physical. The year after he graduated from high school, Branson's parents separated and divorced. In a 2000 interview with Missing Pieces, Rebecca Kleino, having remarried, was asked about the divorce and its impact on Branson. She responded, quote, I'm sure it was difficult. I mean, I always felt that we were fairly close family, but the divorce was on a friendly tone. I mean, Bob and I could still communicate and we could still talk. And so, I mean, there wasn't a lot of anger and despair. In fact, Bob helped me move out. So, you know, it was done on good grounds. It was a mutual desire, I guess, if that's how you want to put it. Mutual agreement that this is what we needed to do. And so it was okay. And the boys, Branson was old enough. He was out of school. We had one other son, and he was still active in school, and decided that he would live with me until after he graduated. But they came and went to Bob's house or to my house as they wanted to. I mean, the doors were always open all the time. End quote. Philip moved in with Rebecca, who moved out of Skidmore to a town located approximately 20 miles away, while Branson made the choice to live with his father at 304 West Oak Street. While details aren't too specific, it's been noted that Branson's father, Bob, suffered from both medical and psychological issues and that Branson was, in a way, helping take care of his father to a degree while living with him. Bob and Branson were close and shared a lot of time and thoughts with one another. One area in which Bob had always suspected but never confirmed was in fact Branson's sexuality. This would all change, though, in a disturbing encounter which would allegedly take place just four days prior to Branson's disappearance. I do want to note, the only place I've ever found this as a source is in Diane Fanning's book, Baby Be Mine, and all other mentions of it seem to cite this as their primary source. According to the story, on April 7th, 2001, Branson went over to the home of a neighbor, Jason Bierman. While in the home, Branson was allegedly given a drug which took effect, leading him into a state of inebriation. According to the writing of Fanning, quote, in an intoxicated state, Branson danced naked, shaved his pubic area, and participated in sexual activity with Jason. End quote. Reportedly the following day, Branson confessed about the situation to his father, acknowledging that he had been drugged and taken advantage of. Branson was upset about the situation, what had happened, and what would happen if anyone found out about the encounter. Bob allegedly suspected that his son was likely gay, but had never been directly told about it before and became very angry at his neighbor for taking advantage of his son. Whether it was due to Branson's fear of it becoming public knowledge or for some other reason, this alleged sexual assault was never reported to authorities. Not long after this discussion with his son, Bob Perry would be hospitalized for several days with the planned date of his discharge set for Wednesday, April 11th. Knowing that Bob would be coming home that day, Branson wanted to take some extra steps to ensure that everything was in order for his return. Branson called his friend, Gina, who agreed to come over and help him clean the house. When Gina arrived, Branson took her into the home and the two discussed what needed to be done. In addition to Gina, Branson had apparently called two other men to come by, though Gina was unable to identify them. These men would spend the most of their time under the hood of Bob's car, apparently replacing its damaged alternator. Gina would report seeing Branson speaking with the two men throughout the day, 
sometimes while they were working on the car and at other times with the three just standing together in the front yard. Gina would later report several details that have never been verified. According to her, at one point during the day, she came into the kitchen where she saw Branson take something out of a cabinet and head outside, concealing whatever the item was. When she later asked him about it, he brushed her off and said it was nothing. She would also claim at another time that day, she found one of the men who had been working on the car in the kitchen, and when she asked him what he was doing, he also replied that it was nothing. At approximately 3 p.m., Gina, who was cleaning the second floor of the home, noticed Branson outside. Approaching the window, Gina called down to Branson asking him what he was doing, partially annoyed that she'd come to help him clean the house and he'd spent half of his time hanging out with these two men who she'd never met before and who she was not introduced to. According to Gina, Branson was holding a set of jumper cables in his hands and told her that he was going to put them in the shed. I should note, the shed was not in the backyard or right next to the house, but was actually located in a lot next to the property. Gina's encounter with Branson is the last time he's confirmed to have been seen by anyone. While this seems fairly cut and dry in terms of where he was going, it may not be so clear. In several articles, I have seen this story told that Branson said he was putting cables in the shed. However, in others, and in Diane Fanning's book, it has been reported that Branson actually said he was going to put the jumper cables in the shed and then run out for a little bit, planning to return shortly. Where he was planning to go, if indeed this is how things went down, is unknown. I think it's important to say at this time that Gina is the only person who has ever given statements about the last day that Branson was seen, and while her description of events could be very valuable, there are some doubts about the veracity of her claims. In her interview with Missing Pieces, Branson's mother made a point of discussing the reliability of Gina's statements, saying, quote, Now, whether either one of those parts of the story are true or not, I honestly can't say for sure. I don't totally trust the individual that told me these things, although she was the one that she was supposedly there. She's kind of known for not always telling the exact story or telling exactly what happened. End quote. Rebecca would further state that the jumper cables were typically left on the porch, implying that it may have been out of the ordinary for Branson to have been bringing them to the shed in the first place. In what I can only describe as strange, after Branson fails to return home, Gina finishes up her work and leaves. Apparently, the two men working on Bob's car do the same. There's no report at that time that anyone was concerned about or even curious about Branson's location. Maybe it's just me, but if I was helping my friend and he went to do something and never came back, I'd at least find it a little strange and probably hang around a little longer to see if he did return. And if he didn't, I'd probably let someone in his family know. But maybe Gina didn't know anyone in his family, and the two men working on the car remain a mystery as it is. Sadly, Branson's disappearance would not be reported for nearly a week due to a confluence of unfortunate circumstances. Firstly, Bob ended up not being discharged from the hospital that day, and so he didn't come home to notice that Branson wasn't there. Secondly, Branson's grandmother, Joanne Stinnett, went by the home the following day, April 12th. She had visited Bob in the hospital and asked him if Branson had come to visit the previous night. Since Bob had been in the hospital, Branson had made a point to visit him each day, but to her surprise, Bob told her he hadn't seen Branson, and this made her decide to visit the house. When she arrived, she found the home vacant, but all doors unlocked and the radio was on inside blaring music. While on the one hand this seemed a little strange, Joanne didn't think all that much of it as it wasn't uncommon in Skidmore to leave the doors unlocked and Branson was 20 years old and could take care of himself. She just figured he'd gone out somewhere and would be home soon. Joanne made several phone calls to the home during the next few days, but never received an answer and Branson never returned her calls. She wasn't sure of what to do as Bob was ill and she didn't want to add any extra weight to his already troubled mind. Her first choice was to contact Rebecca, but she hadn't seen Branson. Joanne tried to contact friends and people who may have been close to Branson, but it was difficult for her to track anyone down. Considering his father's imminent release from the hospital and his efforts to get the house ready for his arrival, she didn't think that he could have gone that far, and he was single and unemployed, not exactly a large variety of locations he could possibly have gone to. Bob Perry was discharged from the hospital on Sunday, April 15th, 
When he returned to the home and found that Branson wasn't there, and no one had seen him for days, he reached out to Rebecca and discussed the situation. Together, Bob, Joanne, and Rebecca went down to the Nottoway County Sheriff's Office to file a missing persons report. According to Rebecca, there were no issues filing the report, and then Sheriff Ben Espy was very receptive to their story. Sheriff's deputies were concerned about the time that had passed, six days since Branson had last been seen, but the family explained that Bob had been in the hospital. Joanne wasn't convinced Branson was missing. He was just 20 years old and not returning calls, and Rebecca had been asked if she'd seen her son, but not given the impression that anything was wrong. Gina hadn't spoken with the family, and so the circumstances surrounding his disappearance were difficult to piece together. By the time they had put it all together, six days had passed. The sheriff's department's first action was to get Branson's image out to the media and to launch a search party where they would be assisted by the Missouri State Police and would begin at the Perry residence, slowly fanning outward, eventually reaching a radius of 15 miles. The 304 West Oak Street home is located essentially at the western edge of Skidmore, with the Perry home being one of the last houses located on the street before it transitions from pavement to gravel and eventually comes to an end at a private residence. Within close proximity to the home, there are farms, fields, wooded areas, and at the time, several abandoned buildings. Multiple ponds were examined, though nothing was found, and while authorities would have liked to have utilized tracking dogs, bad weather following Branson's disappearance would have destroyed any scent he may have left behind. Police had a lot of ground to cover, but the more ground they did cover, the less they seemed to find. A search of the Perry home found that, had Branson elected to leave, he had nothing with him. Bob was unable to point out a single item that was missing from the home, and authorities did locate Branson's wallet in the house, and his van was still at the home. Interestingly, police must have gotten to Gina and had been given the story about the jumper cables. In their search, they had gone through the shed and had been unable to locate the cables, which initially would suggest that Branson may have gone somewhere else with them or had been accosted by someone prior to arriving at the shed. A second search two weeks later, though, would find the jumper cables lying on the ground just inside the door of the shed, and according to authorities, they are 100% certain those jumper cables were not in the shed the first time they searched. Could they have simply missed the cables, or did someone bring them back, either to throw authorities off their trail or to toy with investigators? Unfortunately, due to the materials the cables were made out of and how many hands they had likely passed through, investigators didn't believe fingerprints could be recovered. Unfortunately, the searches had turned up no results. Joanne would later tell the Joseph News Press, quote, Around town, we searched every oil well, every outside toilet. We searched everywhere that was possible for us to think that something could be there, end quote. With searches yielding no new leads, investigators began the long and thorough process of speaking with every person they could that either knew Branson lived near Branson, or may have run into Branson at some point in time. 45 days after Branson's disappearance, investigators had already spoken with over 100 people. One of these people was Gina, and during subsequent interviews, she would reveal further information about Branson's life. According to Gina, Branson had recently begun smoking marijuana and experimenting with other drugs, up to and including amphetamines. This guided police down a road towards several acquaintances involved in the drug trade that knew Branson. According to police and members of Branson's family, multiple individuals with ties to the drug trade in the St. Joseph area were questioned about Branson and claimed to have no idea where he could have been, nor to have seen him in the days leading to his disappearance. Reportedly, polygraph tests were issued to several of these individuals, some of whom passed and others who failed. However, Due to a lack of evidence or information connecting them to Branson's disappearance, authorities have never publicly named these individuals nor listed them as suspects or persons of interest. Rumors began to circulate, and from what I can tell, some of that speculation is attributed to Gina, that Branson may have been in debt to a drug dealer or drug dealers. While police found this information interesting, they were basically at a dead end. There was little they could do without more information. The family responded by doing everything they could to get the word out on Branson's disappearance. Flyers bearing his image and vital statistics were put up in Missouri and several surrounding states. 
By December, more than 1,300 signs about Branson had been put up. Unable to afford to put Branson's image up on new digital billboards, the company who owned the billboards placed his image up free of cost. Rebecca, working as a waitress and attending college at the time, had been saving up money for a trip she wanted to take in the future, a cruise. When Branson vanished, she took that money and began adding to it as best she could to grow a reward for information leading to the arrest or conviction of any individuals who may have been responsible for Branson's disappearance. In total, she accrued $5,000, and years later, she would sell a small plot of land in order to raise the reward up to $10,000. She also participated in a fundraiser in her town, at which time residents chipped in to help get that number higher, but for the most part, the majority of the reward offered was from Branson's mother alone. In an interview with the St. Joseph News Press, Rebecca stated, quote, I put everything I had into this reward. I even sold property to fund it. I'm just hoping it's enough to bring somebody who knows something forward. End quote. Bob Perry had a different thought process on what may have become of Branson. According to Bob, after being told about his son's encounter with the neighbor and seeing how upset Branson was, he suggested the possibility that Branson may have decided to visit friends in Kansas City, some 102 miles to the south. Since Branson did not have an operational vehicle at the time, Bob thought he may have hitchhiked to get to his destination. However, when investigators reached out to individuals in Kansas City, none reported any knowledge of Branson's whereabouts. That didn't mean he didn't try to hitchhike to their location, simply that he probably never made it. If indeed he had been walking along the road looking for a ride, any number of disturbed individuals could have picked him up, but considering all the items left behind, including his wallet, authorities found it highly unlikely that hitchhiking was the proper scenario. In 2003, authorities arrested a man named Jack Wayne Rogers. Rogers, a minister and former Boy Scout leader, was arrested for mutilating the genitals of a transgendered person under the pretense that he had a medical license and could perform gender reassignment surgery. These charges, for which Rogers pled guilty, were in addition to a 30-year sentence he'd received five months earlier after pleading guilty to charges of obscenity and child pornography. While investigating Rogers, authorities made a very disturbing discovery. Rogers had a history of posting on forums and discussing details of crimes he alleged to have committed. In February of 2002, Rogers claimed to have driven to Skidmore the same day that Branson disappeared, where he picked up a blonde hitchhiker. The description Rogers offered was extremely vivid and horrifying, but according to him, he supplied this hitchhiker with drugs, tied him to a tree in a remote area, sexually assaulted, and then murdered him. Sparing you too much grisly information, Rogers did discuss at one point how you could disembowel a victim and put them into a body of water, and since gas could no longer build up, the body would not rise to the surface. Rogers also had multiple posts going into vivid detail about abducting and torturing children. The FBI, discovering these posts, launched an investigation and searched Rogers' home. A necklace resembling one that belonged to Branson was found amongst Rogers' possessions. When questioned about it, Rogers claimed that all of his online postings were simply him living out his fantasies, but were not based on activities he'd actually taken part in. Authorities did not possess enough information then nor now to charge Rogers with any crime in connection to Branson. Several years later, in 2009, Sheriff Espy told reporters that their investigation had pointed them back towards Skidmore and a town north of Skidmore called Quitman. In an interview with the Fulton Sun, Sheriff Espy stated, quote, We haven't completely ruled out Rogers, but the highway patrol had some leads resurfaced from the original investigation that led to the re-questioning of some individuals who had come up before. We spent about two days in the timber working on the notion that the body may have been moved close to a house, but at this point we followed every lead and it still remains an open case. End quote. Quitman, a small town of less than 70 residents, was swarmed by investigators just east of Highway 113. According to the St. Joe News, in the end, Investigators dug a 23-foot deep hole in an area that was 20 by 40 feet, but nothing related to Branson was found. 
Apparently, police had searched in the Quitman area previously, searching for a buried well on a farmer's land. Rebecca later stated that she did not believe Rogers was responsible for Branson's disappearance, nor did she believe that her son would hitchhike. Sadly, in that same year of 2004, Branson's father, Bob, passed away. Unfortunately, months later in December of 2004, another horrifying crime would touch Branson's family. Branson's cousin, 23-year-old Bobby Joe Stinnett, was viciously murdered in Skidmore. Bobby Joe had befriended a woman named Darlene Fisher through a chat room that focused on dogs. Bobby Joe, along with her husband Zeb, operated a dog breeding business in their home. Bobby Joe was pregnant at the time, and Fisher claimed that she was as well. After making arrangements to discuss the purchase of a terrier, Fisher drove over to Bobby Joe's home. According to an article in The Guardian, once alone with Bobby Joe, Fisher strangled the young mother-to-be before using a kitchen knife to cut her unborn child from her body. Bobby Joe did not survive, but her child did, and thankfully authorities were able to track down Fisher through her IP address. As it turned out, she was not Darlene Fisher, but Lisa Montgomery, a woman with a very disturbing past of abuse who had claimed multiple times that she was pregnant despite having her tubes tied in 1990. Her husband at the time believed she actually was pregnant and was shocked to learn the truth. The baby, later named Victoria Joe, was returned to her father. Montgomery was found guilty and given a death sentence. Today, she remains one of 55 women currently living under the death penalty, though Montgomery is not on death row and is instead incarcerated at Federal Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas. Branson's mother, Rebecca, managed to get more money together, raising the reward offered to $20,000. Unfortunately, Rebecca would pass away in February of 2011 after a long and difficult battle with cancer. Rebecca was promised by friends and law enforcement that they would continue looking for Branson after she was gone, and by all accounts, they have kept that promise. Rebecca was buried beside an empty plot, which is reserved for Branson. Her obituary stated that she was preceded in death by her son, Branson Perry. In a conversation with the News Tribune two months later, Rebecca's good friend, Monica Kaysen, the founder of the Center for Missing Persons, addressed this, saying, quote, I think she knew he wasn't alive, but she always wanted to continue to look for him either way, end quote. In the same article, Sergeant Roger Phillips of the Missouri State Highway Patrol said, quote, just because she is not here doesn't mean this train is not going to keep moving. It's about getting the truth. End quote. For the next eight years, investigators would receive sporadic tips, which they would track and which usually did not lead to any breaks in the case. At one point, the family consulted with a psychic who directed authorities to several locations, all of which were searched, none of which produced results. In April of 2019, the Nottoway County Sheriff's Office began posting about Branson on social media in hopes of drumming up new leads. New Sheriff Randy Strong began examining the case shortly after his election. Sheriff Strong firmly believes that Branson's disappearance is connected to the drug trade. Branson's family is still unsure, wondering if Branson was even involved in using drugs or if it was another wild story. The last published statement made by Sheriff Strong doubled down on the drug angle, though, with him telling the Atchison County Mail, quote, It appears to be drug-related. There are certain individuals whose names keep popping up in it. I think it's time that we all put this together and come up with what we can and present it to the prosecutor for them to look and decide. Can we go forward if we don't have a body, or do we continue to look? Those are some tough decisions that we're going to have to make, end quote. I should note that in this article, it's mentioned that Branson disappeared from a home which burned down just days after his disappearance. I haven't found this information anywhere else, but if that's true, that's yet another strange detail in this case. It's been just over 18 years since Branson Perry vanished from his home in Skidmore, Missouri. Nearly 20 years is a long time to go without any answers, and during that time, Truly, only three theories have ever gained much traction. The first theory purports that Branson, for some reason, may have decided to hitchhike, at which time he was picked up by Jack Wayne Rogers, who drugged him, bound him, sexually assaulted him, and then murdered him, 
only to go and write about it on an online forum. The second theory argues that Branson had likely been murdered by someone he knew, and authorities have stated that they believe Branson was lured into a trap by an acquaintance. For some, this man could be Jason Bierman, the neighbor who allegedly assaulted Branson. For others, it could be anyone in the small town of Skidmore. The third and final theory suggests that Branson, in some form or fashion, was connected to the drug trade and either got on someone's bad side or perhaps fell into debt from which he couldn't escape, leading those drug associates to murder him. When last seen, Branson Kane Perry was described as being a Caucasian male, standing 5 feet 9 inches tall and weighing approximately 155 pounds. Branson has blue eyes and blonde hair. He typically keeps his hair short and sometimes shaves it off. There is a small scar on the upper part of his right cheek and a small scar on his left knee. Branson is right-handed, has had his wisdom teeth removed, and has had several fillings. Branson was described as last wearing shorts, a t-shirt, and possibly necklaces and or leather straps with arrowheads on them. He was last seen in the vicinity of 304 West Oak Street, Skidmore, Missouri, on April 11, 2001. If alive today, Branson would be 38 years old and age-progressed photographs are available. Branson's DNA and dental records are on file. He is listed in multiple online databases and according to NamUs, 13 unidentified victims have been excluded by comparison. Typically, I would end the evidence section by discussing my feelings and my hopes for the case. However, today I think it would be best to read to you the words of Rebecca, written online in the years before she passed away. Her words are heartbreaking, as is this case. I have never been a person to ask for much. I am asking, pleading, even begging, for your help in finding my son or finding out what happened to him. I need for this nightmare to end. It's a roller coaster that doesn't ever stop. From the outside, I may appear to be fine. Inside, I will never be okay. If you have ever lost someone who has died, then you know that feeling of complete despair. Over time, it eases and becomes bearable. You know the cause of what happened, and you've been able to put your loved one to rest. You will always have that sense of emptiness, and at times, it overcomes you, but you're able to put it into perspective again. Parents of missing children never have that feeling of ease. It never becomes bearable, only easier to hide. One minute, you're okay and functioning. The next minute, something triggers inside, and you plummet to the deepest ravine you could ever imagine and can't find any way out. It can be something as simple as a smell, a taste, a sound, a touch, and all the horror is there again. It never ends. Please, 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 find it in your hearts to come forward if you have any information. You may think it is insignificant, but it may be the key link to answers. The disappearance of Branson Perry is such an incredibly frustrating case. It feels like the more you dig into it, the less you find. The idea that Branson disappeared from right near his own house and not a single person in a town of less than 400 people have seen or heard anything about who possibly could have done it is crazy to me. Well, I suppose there are rumors and tips, but nothing solid. 18 years later, and police are still investigating angles they were looking at from the beginning, that Branson may have been involved in drugs and owed a debt to someone who grew impatient and violent. Multiple areas have been excavated, hundreds questioned, polygraphs issued, and all this time later, not a whole lot of new information. Obviously, authorities may be holding back some evidence they're in possession of, but it's clear that evidence hasn't given them the ability to file any charges yet. So what do you look at when someone seems to vanish into nothingness from close proximity to his own home in a small town? For many in Skidmore, it was difficult to imagine that Branson's disappearance could be tied to anyone in town. Many who have looked at Skidmore have pointed out the darker side, myself included, much to the chagrin of residents. But I do want to make it clear that this is not a bad town, and unfortunately, horrible things can happen anywhere. If it was a resident, that would mean that living somewhere amongst that small population, there's a killer who hasn't yet been caught. As a response to that, Many people considered it likely that whatever happened to Branson must have been the work of an outsider, someone just passing through. 
Examining the first theory, following the 2003 arrest of Jack Wayne Rogers, many people felt that their suspicions were correct. Jack Wayne Rogers is obviously an extremely disturbed individual. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on some of the things this monster has done, so if you don't want to hear those details, I'd suggest you skip ahead two minutes now. Here you've got a guy who worked himself into several positions where he could have unsupervised access to young children without anyone ever suspecting him. He was a Presbyterian minister and a Boy Scout leader. Unfortunately, given the way things have been in the past 20 years, that isn't exactly all that surprising. The late 90s and early 2000s ushered in the era of the Catholic Church scandal, and the Boy Scouts have certainly not remained free from sin in this regard. According to official court documents, when Rogers was arrested, computers at his home and business were seized, and in total they discovered at least 860 images of child pornography that included sexually explicit photos of prepubescent children. Rogers was also involved in the transmission of these images, which netted him charges for the distribution of child pornography as well. And as sick and disturbing as this is, it's the tip of the iceberg. In addition to the child pornography photos, they discovered photos of Rogers himself in possession of severed male genitals. In the photos, Rogers can be seen wearing them on his head, placing them in his mouth, and chewing on them, among other horrifying images. Rogers also sent out these images, which resulted in obscenity charges. Investigators found surgical and bondage equipment in Rogers' home and vehicle. Later, Rogers crudely conducted gender reassignment surgery while an assistant photographed it in a hotel that resulted in bleeding which couldn't be stopped. Rogers would later tell this assistant that he had eaten the victim's genitals. Evidence does suggest this was not the first time Rogers had performed such grisly mutilation under the guise of being a trained professional. Oh, and let me add that in court, Rogers argued that his distribution of child pornography was, quote, a victimless crime. I think we'll stop the background there. If you wish to read more about the court proceedings, you can look up United States v. Rogers, number 04-2563. I will also provide the link in my sources. Sources, huh? What a concept. What ultimately led to the connection between Branson and Rogers was Rogers' own writings online, where he, in vivid and disturbing detail, described abducting, drugging, torturing, raping, and murdering a blonde-haired young man he picked up in Skidmore on the same day that Branson went missing. Apparently, this was the kind of story Rogers liked to share online, especially in a situation where he was with someone who would go along with his act ask him questions, and praise him for his sick and depraved acts. The problem is, there's no actual proof. I know it's easy to say that Rogers is a monster, and I am by no means arguing against that, but authorities sort of had their hands tied. Rogers denied any connection to Branson, claimed the story was nothing more than fantasy, and that he'd never committed any of the acts he'd written about. FBI agents did recover a necklace from Rogers' home that resembled a necklace which belonged to Branson but they were unable to prove the necklace was one and the same. And so, while much of the information seems to add up, it's mostly circumstantial and not enough to actually charge Rogers with the murder of Branson Perry. It is difficult to dismiss it, though, isn't it? What are the chances that this guy just happened to describe all these details about a man who matched Branson's description taken the same day Branson disappeared? Well, Rogers spent his time in Fulton, Missouri, 250 miles from Skidmore. Branson's story for a period of time was big news in the state, and so it isn't impossible to imagine that Rogers could have read about the story and then used it for the basis of one of his fantasies. We just can't say for sure which way it is, and Rogers certainly isn't talking and remains steadfast that he played no role in Branson's death and knows nothing about what happened to him. As frustrating as that is, and as difficult as it is to accept, there's nothing that can currently be done to prove a connection unless further evidence or Branson himself is found. I'd say given Rogers' history, the photos, and horrifying acts he committed, it may be short-sighted to rule him out completely, and it seems that investigators agree, for the most part. The last information I could find was that while the investigation has turned another way, Rogers is not completely ruled out. So I guess all you can do is try to figure out how Rogers would have gotten his hands on Branson. It doesn't seem likely that this guy could have just grabbed Branson on his way to the shed with the jumper cables without anyone noticing. Not to mention, 
How did Rogers even get there? He just drove around this small town in hopes that he'd see a young man to abduct? Now, Rogers, in his story, claimed that the man was hitchhiking. And while Rebecca does not believe her son would have gone hitchhiking, his father did suggest the possibility that Branson may have tried to hitchhike to Kansas City. That seems to be the most likely possibility here, though why Branson would go hitchhiking to meet friends without telling them he was coming and while leaving behind his wallet and all of his personal belongings is a scenario I don't have the logical explanation for. Personally, I think Rogers is a sick and twisted monster who I hope remains behind bars until he draws his last breath. However, there are many who believe that if Branson was taken by anyone, it had to be someone he knew and trusted rather than Rogers. Otherwise, he would have fought back, and he knew how to handle himself. And that leads us to our second theory. Many people have argued that Branson had to have been lured into a bad situation by someone he knew. Not a whole lot of suspects have been mentioned in this category, though, with the most frequently named being the neighbor who allegedly drugged and assaulted him, Jason Bierman. I did read one article, though I could not find a corroborative source, which claimed that Bierman moved away shortly after Branson's disappearance. If that's true, it seems a little suspicious, but given that authorities were told about what had happened, it seems unlikely they wouldn't have spoken to Bierman and questioned him about Branson. That's not to say he would have admitted to anything, but his name has never come up in regard to the investigation. I think given the story that has been told, he certainly would have had some motive to commit this crime. But the problem I have is, how likely was Branson to go along with him anywhere? I guess the circumstances could be different from what we imagine. Sometimes people make weird choices or are simply manipulated by someone who is skilled and charming, or maybe this guy had a weapon. Maybe this guy told Branson he wanted to apologize, or he did apologize and asked for help. Any number of scenarios could have been involved to get Branson over to his place, at which time anything could have happened. I mean, this guy had allegedly already drugged and assaulted Branson on at least one occasion. It isn't difficult to imagine he could have done it again, but there's little to work with here, and there are others to look at. Now, we don't know who the two guys were working on the car the day Branson disappeared. Frankly, we don't even know how much of the story of that day is true, considering that Gina does not appear to be that much of a reliable source, and over all of these years, I couldn't find a single article in which this Gina has actually interviewed or volunteered any public information. Her conversations were restricted purely to the family and investigators, and every time they talked, she seemed to throw something new in. From Branson taking jumper cables to the shed, to a guy being in the kitchen, to Branson allegedly smoking weed and using amphetamines. I'm not saying her story is untrue, but I am saying it wouldn't take much to poke holes in it. At this time, I'd like to say, if Gina is out there somewhere, I would love to speak with you. If you know Gina, feel free to contact me as I'd love to get in touch with her, but I doubt she wants to get in touch with me. So, really all we can do here is ask, could Branson have been abducted and murdered by someone he knew? Yes. The jumper cables have always fascinated me. How authorities say they were not there the day they began searching, but then they showed up two weeks later. If you had abducted Branson and the jumper cables came along for one reason or another, why the hell would you bring them back? It's never made any sense to me. It feels like someone toying with investigators, but at the same time, part of me wonders if they weren't just missed during the first search. I know that seems unlikely, but I have to examine some other possibility, as the jumper cables make no sense to me whatsoever. Also, I don't know about you, but I keep my jumper cables in the trunk of my car, not in my shed. So, just from the day of his disappearance, you've got Gina, two unnamed men who were working on Bob's car, and the possibility of Jason Bierman, let alone Rogers. Gina doesn't report seeing anyone other than the two mechanics. Of course, I suppose she could have missed something, especially if she were experimenting with marijuana and amphetamines at the time she was at the house. What really bothers me about this is that this is a town of less than 400 people, and Gina can't identify by sight the two men who were working on the car. She'd never met them before, and I suppose has never seen them since. They don't necessarily have to be from Skidmore, they could have been from a neighboring town, and maybe Gina really didn't know them, but it's always been bizarre to me that we've never heard anything else about them. No names, no interviews, nothing. You'd imagine if you were working on the car of a friend's father, and the same day that friend disappears, you might want to contribute to search efforts or give an interview or do something beyond just closing the hood, driving away, and never looking back. 
Ultimately, a lot of this comes down to motive, and for the most part, we don't have a motive of why anyone would have done something to Branson. We know Bierman could have had a reason to want to do something, but beyond him, we've got nothing. I suppose an argument could have taken place, or if Branson truly were using drugs, he could have been out of it, or a friend could have been out of it, and almost anything could have happened, though none of this explains why Branson would disappear in that specific moment. Of course, we do have to look at Gina's story and acknowledge that she also claimed he said he was going somewhere and would be back later. If that's true, then the possibilities of where he could have gone, who he could have run into, and what could have happened are a bit more expansive. One motive, which has come up a lot, is the possibility that Branson had issues with drug dealers, and that leads us into the final theory. Almost since day one, authorities have focused on individuals in the drug trade that Branson knew. From Gina bringing up drugs to police interviewing and polygraphing several of those people, it seems apparent that if there's one theory that law enforcement is putting most of its support behind, it's that Branson was the victim of someone involved with drugs. At the time of his disappearance, Branson wasn't working, and by all accounts, he wasn't exactly rolling in money. So it isn't hard to imagine he could have earned a debt to a drug dealer. However, some have suggested that the debt occurred in a different way. Most drug dealers are not going to give you a bunch of drugs on the promise that you'll pay them later. It's a pretty unsuccessful business model to offer drugs with payment being a rain check. I'd imagine most dealers that conduct business in this way are not conducting business for very long. Sure, it could happen from time to time, maybe for a friend, but how much in debt do you have to be for a drug dealer to want to kill you over it? I used to buy weed when I was in high school, and nobody, no matter how close they were to me, gave it to me without the money up front. Now remember, if they're going to kill you, they're never getting their money back. So they have to believe either that you're never going to pay them, or they have to make an example out of you. If you were a drug dealer, and an unemployed 20-year-old wanted to buy some drugs from you, but didn't have money at the time, and for whatever reason you agreed, are you going to give this guy a large sample of the good stuff, or are you just going to give him a little bit? I guess it depends on how smart you are and how well you know him. But what if this wasn't a matter of Branson being unable to pay for drugs he was using recreationally? What if, due to the situation he was in, his lack of a job, his father's medical condition, living in this small house in this small town, he made the choice to get involved in selling drugs? I do want to say, when I explore this area, I am in no way meaning to impugn Branson's reputation or make any kind of judgments against him, but I do think it's a possibility that needs to be considered. Especially if Branson was beginning to get involved in drugs, it isn't hard to imagine that his decision-making could have been affected. Also, when you see some guy walking around with nice clothes, driving a good car, and he doesn't have a real job, maybe you want what he has. So, just to play devil's advocate here, Let's imagine that Branson cuts a deal where he's going to be given a certain amount of a particular drug, he's responsible for selling it, from the profits he pays back his dealer, plus some profit, and Branson gets to keep the leftovers. That's how this often works. However, there are those who are not going to give you product unless you pay in advance, and obviously that's not something Branson could do. It just seems more likely to me that if you're a drug dealer and you're so pissed that someone owes you money that you're willing to commit murder, it's more likely a large sum than a small one. Unless, of course, the dealer himself is tweaked out of his mind, and then who knows what he's going to do. I've seen it suggested in some places that Branson could have owed money to multiple dealers, and that would certainly open the door to more danger, especially if those dealers knew each other and talked. While we can't prove the reliability of her statements, we also can't ignore that Gina said when she was in the kitchen, she saw Branson taking something out of a cabinet and then going outside. When she asked him what it was, he said nothing. Later, she sees one of the unknown mechanics in the kitchen looking around, and when she asks what he's doing, he says nothing. Gina sees Branson for the last time after both of these kitchen encounters. Is it possible that Branson either had drugs or money, and when he allegedly told her he was going somewhere but would be back soon, that he was either meeting up with a dealer or perhaps even someone he was planning to sell to? That's an angle you can't get to unless you consider the possibility that Branson could have been dealing. Everyone always looks at this and says, a dealer totally could have done this. But what if Branson was dealing, and someone told him they wanted to purchase all that he had? So he gets a ride over there with the two mechanics, or he walks. And when he arrives, he meets someone who brandishes a weapon and tells him to turn over the drugs. Now the guy could have intended to kill Branson from step one, 
or maybe he was going to let him go, but Branson tried to fight back. That's purely speculative, but it's not something that can be dismissed out of hand. Obviously, the drug theory has a lot of weight behind it, but I also wanted to add something I haven't seen mentioned anywhere. By Branson's father's account, his son was either gay or bisexual. I don't know what the gay scene is like in Skidmore, but since he wasn't fully out to his family, it's possible he was involved in relationships or hookups with someone they didn't know about. I don't know where you'd look when it comes to that possibility, but I don't think you can completely ignore this possibility that he could have been in a relationship or had been dating someone previously and things went bad or someone got jealous. Maybe Branson did say he was leaving and would be back, and maybe he was going to visit someone he didn't want anyone to know he was visiting. It's possible. So you've got basically these three theories, and for the most part, you can make any of them fit this mystery. You could see Branson being the victim that Rogers wrote about. You could see someone he knew or a former lover doing something horrible to him for reasons unknown, or maybe to stop him from reporting an assault to the police. You could also see Branson getting into debt with a violent dealer, or perhaps himself being robbed by a buyer. In a lot of missing persons cases, you find yourself in a corner with absolutely no idea, no suspects, no theories, nothing that makes any sense. It's as if the person just vanished into thin air. This isn't exactly one of those cases. There are multiple theories here with some evidence to support them, but not enough. So I don't know what's more frustrating, not knowing at all, or having a pretty good idea, but not being able to prove it. What I do know, beyond a doubt, is that whatever happened to Branson Perry is an enduring mystery that will hang over Skidmore until the truth is revealed. Branson's parents passed away before they could learn the truth or find Branson, or at least be given the closure to be able to put him to rest. An empty plot remains beside Rebecca's grave, where Branson will rest someday, if he is ever found. While we don't have the answers, there is one truth that cannot be denied. Someone, somewhere, knows exactly what happened to Branson Perry. Whether it's the person responsible, someone that person told, or someone who witnessed something they've never come forward with. It's too late now to assuage the grief of Branson's parents, but it's never too late to do the right thing and give him the ability to be put to rest beside his mother. You don't even have to give your name. You can call in an anonymous tip, send an anonymous email, an anonymous letter. One or two sentences that would take 10 seconds out of your day could provide relief to the remnants of a family who will otherwise always wonder what happened to Branson Perry. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Branson Perry, there are many news articles and websites discussing his case. Diane Fanning wrote a book entitled Baby Be Mine, the shocking true story of a woman accused of murdering a pregnant woman to steal her child. While the book focuses on Bobby Joe Stinnett, there is a very detailed chapter about Branson. Beyond that, there's a website hosted by the family that goes into detail, and it will be listed in my sources along with everything else I could find on this case. If you have any information about the vanishing of Branson Perry, please contact the Nottaway County Sheriff's Office at area code 660-582-7451. You can also contact the Missouri State Highway Patrol at area code 573-751-3313. One, three. You can also contact the Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-843-5678. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, Instagram message me at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. As some of you are aware, on Patreon, I will begin posting one episode per month that is not available in the normal feed beginning in September. In these episodes, I'll discuss a variety of cases, including solved cases, which are voted on monthly by patrons. These episodes will also be available through the Himalaya podcast app for those who become premium members. But speaking of Patreon, it's time for a shout out to our amazing Patreon producers. Angie Dodd, Emily Smith. Megan Cotter, Kate Alexander, Chandra Moreau, Robbie Blue, Brian Kemmerling, Wannabe Sleuth 2, Laura Dickinson, Julia Rexon, Diane Dyson, 
Tom Archer, Eamon Brady, Nick Mohar Schurz, Alicia Lorraine, Krista Colvin, Randy Wyland, Brittany Bivens, Glenda Piper, and Megan. You're all amazing. And if you're new and I mispronounced your name, just shoot me a message and I'll correct it. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Trace Evidence and for all your nice comments on social media. They've meant a lot to me these last couple of weeks. I'm going to leave you with a promo for a podcast called Morbidology that you should absolutely check out because it's amazingly done. So I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence. Morbidology is a weekly true crime podcast hosted by me, Emily G. Thompson, author of Unsolved Child Murders and co-author of Unsolved Murders, True Crime Cases Uncovered. 911 emergency. My son shot my husband. I need an ambulance. He's bleeding. Using audio from 911 calls, interrogations, trial testimony and interviews, Morbidology takes a look at some of the most mysterious and disturbing crimes from all across the world. Do you know why you're here? For a uh, home invasion gone terribly wrong. From shocking murders to missing children, we focus on a variety of cases and put you, the listener, right into the middle of the investigation. Listen to Morbidology now on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, Podbean and wherever else you get your podcasts.